Ah, yes, the legendary 007 wit. Or at least half of it. Bond is back was that marketing phrase that would appear every two years with the same monotonous regularity as a chronic snorer being mistaken for a lawnmower in need of fresh spark plugs. In 1999, another Bond film was released, one that again received a mixed reaction. Always wanted to have Christmas in Turkey. The world is not enough. I have to get it back or somebody's gonna have my ass. First things first. 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies was a successful film that, thanks to its accelerated development, did not necessarily have what it takes to make it to the pantheon of the all-time great Bond films. Its follow-up in 1999 has also not developed a reputation as being a top-rated Bond film for various reasons. But if I'm honest, I actually enjoy watching The World Is Not Enough, or at least much of it. And that's mainly because I like it just a little bit more than the film that comes directly before it, and certainly more than the hot, sticky mess that was to directly follow it. I am offering you the opportunity to walk out with the money, Mr. Bond. And I'm giving you the opportunity to walk out with your life. Piers Brosnan was back for his third tilted James Bond. Would you like to check my figures? Oh, I'm sure they're perfectly round enough. He's in Spain retrieving some money when things don't go so well. Back in Britain, in the vaults of MI6 headquarters, the money's rightful owner, Sir Robert King, an old university friend of M's, inadvertently sets off a bomb. King's daughter, Electra, had once been kidnapped by the anarchist Renard, and M had advised against paying the ransom. I wonder if any of these details will become relevant later in the film. Bond is on the injured list, but pulls some strings to have his fitness certified by the company Medico, Dr. Molly Warmflash. I see the good doctor has cleared you. Notes you have exceptional stamina. I'm sure she was touched by his dedication. To the job in hand. Bond catches up with Electra King in Azerbaijan. She's now head of the family oil business, where she's building an oil pipeline to the west. There's an attempt on her life, foiled by Q Branch's latest invention, the really puffy jacket. And of course, Bond and Electra spend a pleasant evening together, uh, oh, I don't know, playing Sabutio. Bond is clearly catching feelings for Electra, while Electra is clearly catching from Bond whatever his last round of antibiotics didn't adequately deal with. I want to see Valentin Sukovsky. Valentin Sukovsky appears vaguely involved with Electra King's shadier business dealings. Meanwhile, Bond follows King's security head who, and this is where things start to get a little whiffy, Anyway, Bond ends up impersonating a physicist at an installation decommissioning nuclear weapons where Bond meets Dr. Christmas Jones. Are you here for a reason? Or are you just hoping for a glimmer? Yes, 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 I know. Anyway, Renard's men are there stealing stuff from a bomb. There's no point living if you can't feel alive. Bond accuses Electra of being involved with some plot with Renard. There's no point in living if you can't feel alive. Isn't that right, Electra? Isn't that your motto? And then we see Electra's heel turn, where she captures M. <laughs> Bond and Christmas Jones work together to recover some missing plutonium. M takes up a new hobby of fixing clocks, and look, to cut a long story short, or at least shorter than the film's editor managed, Renard and Electra steal a Russian nuclear sub and plan to explode it in the Bosphorus, irradiating Istanbul and making competing pipelines unusable. I could have given you the world. Oh, the world is not enough. Foolish sentiment. Family motto. Bond deals with Electra, and then there's a long sequence in the sub where Bond and Renard fight while Denise Richards in a wet t-shirt tries to <coughs> Denise Richards is in a wet t-shirt. A film that starts okay, starts to lose its way in the middle, and then by the end doesn't make any sense. But that's okay, because all of this has been an elaborate setup for a killer dirty joke. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. Here's a film that seesaws between the good, the bad and the ugly, like Clint Eastwood in a playground. There's a great villain in Electra. We have the rather ordinary henchman in Renard. Some great action in places, but action that drags on for far too long. There's a stunning Bond woman, but one who's so woefully miscast as a nuclear physicist that she would become better known for appearing in trashy reality shows than for her acting talent. The film's got a final climax that feels about as heart pumping as preparing a tax return. But there was a killer theme tune, and the plot was interesting until it started to unravel. And once it unravels, it really unravels. Like a Labrador puppy who's gotten hold of the bog roll. Get lost. No, 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 down the back. Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli had various directors in the frame, such as Peter Jackson, Joe Dante, Alfonso Cuaron. 
but eventually British director Michael Apted scored the gig. Apted had mainly directed dramas, but he was best known for the perennial documentary series Seven Up. He had a keen visual eye, and The World Is Not Enough is a pretty film. Most of the location work was carried out in Turkey, Spain and the UK, with a few scenes shot in Azerbaijan itself. The main plot was inspired by what was happening then with oil companies vying for control of untapped reserves of countries of the former Soviet Union. The film's main hook, the woman Bond's been sleeping with turning out to be the main villain, was genuinely something new for the series. Alas, a poorly chosen American starlet proving to be an underwhelming Bond woman to play against Bond was not something new for the series. David Arnold returned with another energetic score, with the film featuring easily my personal favourite Bond song of the Brosnan era, The World Is Not not enough, performed by pop group Garbage. You can't kill me. I'm already dead. Uh, not dead enough for me. Piers Brosnan in his third film has settled into the role by this point. Bond. James Bond. His stock in trade would be mourning dead lovers who turn out to be villains and gurning. He's making faces all over the place in this movie. I mean, those mime classes all those years ago sure came in handy. Sophie Marceau as the Bond woman turned Bond villain It's time for you to die gives us one of the series' best villains. Her heel turn is planted early enough in the script, but Bond's realisation midway through the film stings him like a paper cut treated with isopropyl alcohol. He feels no pain. He can push himself harder, longer than any normal man. The bullet will kill him but he'll grow stronger every day until the day he dies. Her lover Renard is supposed to be a man who's dying thanks to a botched MI6 assassination, but can't feel any pain. That's probably helpful for watching the latter parts of this film. No hard feelings, Mr. Bond, but we're even. Soon, you'll feel nothing at all. Robert Carlyle was an interesting choice, but the film never really settles on what they should do with him. Is he a tortured soul, a monstrous killer, a superhuman terrorist, or what? He's initially billed as a Terminator, but he's later shown to just be a lovesick puppy. Judy Dench appears as M, and now firmly part of the plot for a change. Rather than just throwing a dossier at Bond 10 minutes into the film, and then retiring to her office to polish off the bourbon, getting blasted and singing sea shanties. I think you're not here to think. You're here to do what I tell you. John Cleese appears as Q's assistant R, but this film would also prove to be Desmond Llewellyn's final appearance as Q. Always have an escape plan. Robbie Coltrane returns as Zukovsky, only to be unceremoniously offed. Chill out, James. Then there's the Bond woman, nuclear physicist Dr. Christmas Jones. Denise Richards is, let's be charitable, woefully miscast, like that one-man show production of A Christmas Carol starring David Hasselhoff. I mean, it's not a terrible show, but I really could have done without the songs in German. Up here we've got hydrogen bombs that your lab built leaking tritium, which I've spent the last six months trying to clean up. So if you need any protection at all, it's from me. She can do the running from explosions well enough, but there's not enough whiskey in the world to make anyone believe that she's a credible nuclear phys ed instructor. I know what I said. The opening teaser, longer than usual, was an exciting start with two set pieces in one, including an exciting chase where Bond using a rocket boat chases an assassin down the Thames. Then the plot starts to get confusing, and it's at the point where the nuclear physicist is dressed like Lara Croft. I played a nuclear psychiatrist in a James Bond movie. The main threat irradiating Istanbul so competing oil pipelines are out of commission isn't really exciting enough, and the actual climax of the film, Bond and Renard wrestling with a plutonium rod in a sinking sub just seems to make a decently budgeted action movie seem really small scale and cheap. But yet despite all of this, I have an ever, ever so slight preference for this over Tomorrow Never Dies. This film at least has a decent first half and a good villain. Many of you will have your own rankings of the Bond films and of the Brosnan era. And I place this one as the second best Brosnan, which sounds like high praise, but it's a very, very distant second behind Goldeneye. Now, of course, that's a personal rating, so take to the comments to tell me your own ratings for the Brosnan era, but you need to show your proof. Sophie Marceau is worth 30 points, Jet Boat Chase is 15 points, Renard is minus 15 points, Dance Music Artist Goldie Getting Nuked is 5 points, Zukovsky is plus 10 points, Overall Lack of Humour is minus 10 points, but the film's final gag is plus 20, Denise Richards is plus 5, but then she speaks and it drops to minus 20, John Cleese and Desmond Llewellyn is plus 10, M is plus 15, Bond having to sleep with his doctor to pass his physical is plus 5, her name being Dr. Molly Warmflush is plus 10, then Money Penny shaming the doctor is another 
another plus 5. The ending on the sub is minus 20 simply because of its sheer dullness. Add a plus 10 modifier for a good musical score and plus 5 for a great theme song, but then the film has to receive a 10 point stat nerf simply because it sits on the shelf next to Die Another Day, absorbing some of that film's sheer awfulness by a process called DVD osmosis. All up, that's a... Uh, oh shit, I forgot to turn the calculator on so I have to start again. Sophie Marceau is worth 30 points. The jet boat chases 15 points. Renard. The world is not enough, often abbreviated to twine. Surprised. Was successful enough on its release to become the most successful Bond film at the box office to that time. And that's with reviews that were not particularly effusive or glowing. They weren't terrible, but nobody was falling over themselves to hail Denise Richards as the greatest Bond woman ever. It just goes to show how review-proof Bond films are at the time of release. Subsequently, the film's reputation has taken a bit of a dive. The World Is Not Enough shows the Bond films do have to try that little bit harder to not feel like you're watching another rote exercise in making a spy movie. Its awful bits aren't enough for me to proclaim it as a purely terrible film, but the promising bits aren't good enough to give anyone a feel-good buzz, like downing two bottles of non-alcoholic gin. Maybe. A middling effort is probably the best way to describe this film as a whole. Alas, The World Is Not Enough is not enough. James Bond Will Return is a promise that appears on the end credits of most Bond films. Though, when you know the next film is Die Another Day, it does feel more like a veiled threat. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. I'm an idiot. Surprised? Mm -hmm.